Hey everyone, I'm Will, and in this video, I wanna show you how to use Adobe Lightroom to edit your landscape photographs. And if you like, you can follow along by downloading the raw files via the link below. All right, let's get into it. So on my computer, I've opened up Lightroom Classic, and what you wanna do now is import the raw files that hopefully you've downloaded, so you can follow along with me step by step. Either way, importing is something you'll need to do to be able to access your raw files. So it's down the bottom left hand corner, the import button. When I select that, we're going to get an option here that comes up and it's basically saying, what would you like to import? What would you like to allow Lightroom to view and give you access to edit? So for today, we're going to use the WP reference files. So when I select that folder, you'll see that we have these two options come up. They're both selected. So I'm going to push the import button down here. Before I do that, I just wanna show you that up the top, you have these options with importing. We're using add, and that is basically saying, I wanna add these files from wherever they're currently located and just give Lightroom access to view them. If we use the copy function, that's a way that we can actually take the files from one destination and move them to another destination. You will use this when you're importing from your camera's SD card and putting the raw files either on your computer or on a portable hard drive. I definitely recommend using a portable hard drive instead of saving everything to your computer. Um, so in that case, you would select the copy function, choose your raw files, which would be from your SD card, and then over on the right hand side here, you're going to select your destination. And that's where you would typically use your portable hard drive. And maybe you'd have a folder in there appropriately named for those rules that you're going to save for that given day. And you would import. So that way you're going from SD card, it's copying it from there to a different source, your hard drive. As I said though, for today, we have these files already on the computer. So now we're just using the add function which essentially is just saying to Lightroom, you can now view these raw files so we can edit them. So what we do is push the import button. And now these raws are still located on my computer. It's just Lightroom has permission to view them. On the left-hand side here now, this is where you can actually view what's in your catalog. So whenever you add raw files to Lightroom, it creates catalogs, which you can really just think of um, subfolders. And by default, it will just name them whatever the folder was that you imported at the time. So ours was the WP reference folder. It's now added that into the catalog. You can even down the bottom here in collections, create your own subfolders again to help you break down all your different images. This is not something I personally do, but some people like doing this stuff. To do that, it would just be a matter of clicking new collection, create, you could make it something um, appropriate obviously so for today we would call it tutorial and it says do you want to include the selected photos yep sure why not so it added that one that was selected and now that's in the tutorial folder down there I'm gonna do control Z if you're on a Mac it's command Z to undo but that's how you do that function anyway so I'm not gonna worry about that for that to for today I'm just happy with how it's created the default folder there for us the WP reference files now Time to post process. So the two images we have here, two different scenes, but very common scenarios that we come up against as landscape photographers, sunrises, sunsets, scenes with a relatively large dynamic range. So how do we start editing our photos in Lightroom? We're viewing them, but how do we edit them? It's the develop tab up the top right hand corner. So first of all, let's start on our mountain scene and I'm going to push the develop button up the top here. I've selected that and now you're going to see that we have a totally different layout. Down the bottom, I have the other image that's part of the same folder and then the mountain one on the right. Everything in Lightroom can be moved around. So if I click and drag upright, I'm adjusting those thumbnails down the bottom. I obviously don't really need to see those. So that's why I'm minimizing that. Same as the tab on the right hand side, this is our editing panel. We really don't need that very large either. Obviously the priority is being able to see the image. Also on the left hand side, we have a few other tabs. My goal today is not to show you things that you're not going to use. I only wanna show you the stuff that is applicable to us as landscape photographers. There's a hundred plus tools in here. We only really need to know how to use a handful and know how and why to use them to effectively edit our images. So let's get into the post-processing now. 
First and foremost, before you start processing the image, it's really important to pre-visualise the final result and actually have some kind of goal in mind. You need to know what you're trying to achieve. So for our image today, it's really some of the very basic things that we want to do, common things that you'll most likely need to do to most RAW files. Reveal all those darker details, recover those bright sky details, bring back some of the colour into the image and create a bit of depth and atmosphere in the scene. And that's something I'm pretty much trying to do on the majority of my images, those things right there that I mentioned. So let's have a look at doing that. Over on the right hand side, we have these panels here. Now don't get overwhelmed, we don't even need to use all of them. Firstly, we're just going to open up the lens correction tab. This is somewhere that you should typically navigate to first. If you forget, don't worry, <laughs> I probably forget 50% of the time anyway. But what we can do here is remove the chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration is something that we can get along the edges of our images. I don't really have much in this one here, but you can get green, purple, blue. It's a very vibrant neon glow that can sometimes appear depending on your lens and the light you're shooting. So I typically say select that one and then you can enable the profile correction. This is where Lightroom is going to help repair some of the vignetting and distortion that your lens may have and you'll see here it recognizes the lens we were shooting with and applies that again if you forget not a huge deal but it is handy especially if you have a scene with a very large um, horizon portion there like a seascape or something like that so that's the lens corrections out of the way now let's jump into the basic tab this is where we're going to do a lot of what's called the global adjustments now global adjustments are adjustments that are made across the entire image, that's the term global. The global adjustments for me are primarily about balancing out the exposure, getting the exposure right, bringing the darker tones up, bringing the bright tones down. You'll see here on the right hand side, it's very self-explanatory and it's all sliders that we adjust left and right. If you want to reset a slider, double click on it and it goes back to zero. So for this image, I think we wanna make it brighter initially. So let's do that. If I grab the exposure slider and start dragging that to the right, I'm starting to reveal a lot of those darker tones and I'm starting to see everything in the mountains. Although what I've done is actually made the sky too bright, haven't I? If you look at the histogram now, you'll see that those highlight details are getting lost all up here in the sky. So what we can do is grab the highlight slider and pull that back to the left. You'll see now we're recovering that sky. So I'm going to pull that down and probably leave it about there. I'll often allow the highlights to clip very, very slightly. They're not really at the moment, um, but that just represents reality. The reality, reality is highlights are bright and shadows are quite dark. The key is just leaving just enough detail there for us to enjoy, but you don't want to recover everything too extreme like this. And any shadows, for example, have them really bright because now we get a dynamic range that doesn't represent reality. In reality, the shadows, especially those closest to the viewer, should be quite dark. And again, highlights, they're coming from the sun, a flaming ball of fire in the sky, especially if the sun is a little bit higher above the horizon, your highlights should actually have some white, bright tones in them. So we don't wanna get an extreme dynamic range like this. So let's make those adjustments again. We've got the exposure brighter, that's brought everything up evenly. We're going to recover that sky now. I'll leave that about approximately there. Again, the number itself doesn't matter at all. All I'm really looking at is the image itself and then sometimes I cross-reference the histogram. Now the shadows I'll bring up a certain way, yeah, about here. What we're going to do is local adjustment soon to help separate all the tones and create that depth. We wanna have a variance of tonality as we travel from the front through to the back, but we'll get to that soon. As we run down the rest of the sliders, so highlights and shadows represent those extreme ends of the histogram. The whites and blacks move into the midtones. I don't really want to adjust those at the moment. And then we've got these ones here, texture, clarity, the dehaze. These give the illusion of creating exactly what they say, more texture, clarity, and either adding or removing haze. I like to use some of these, but locally, going in and do it on specific areas, not globally. And funny enough, all of these are somewhat doing contrast adjustments themselves. If you look at the histogram when we grab the clarity slider, as I'm adjusting that, see tones are moving around. 
different tones and again so it's kind of creating the illusion of this stuff happening we're going to leave those for now definitely most images i'll adjust the vibrance and saturation because the raw files come out so flat so what we're going to do is pull the vibrance up on this one i just find generally with most most of my work i'm pulling the vibrance up anywhere from 10 to 30 but then the saturation i go easy on that and i only generally bring up anywhere from zero to maybe 10 or 15, just depending on the scene. For today, why don't we just leave it roughly here, 20 and five for argument's sake. Now for the color work, I very rarely will adjust the color profile or even the white balance here. What I like to just use initially is the temperature and tint sliders. As I grab that temperature slider, if I drag it to the left, we cool things down, we drag it to the right, we warm things up. Again, you double click, it resets. For today, this image, I'm happy to maybe warm this one up slightly. I think it really works well with the snow grass we've got through here and the highlights in the sky, etc. So I pulled that to the right. The tint, some images you'll just see there's extra magenta in there. Some might look too green, just depending on how your camera has shot the scene. This one here, I'm pretty happy with how the tint's at. So I'll think we'll leave that. So there we go. That's our basic tab out of the way. And honestly, especially when you're first starting out, just some of those basic adjustments there could be all you need just to get the image across the line. Now we have the before and after option down the lower left here. We select that. You can see how far we've come just by making some of those very basic adjustments, bringing up the exposure, recovering the highlights and shadows and introducing the vibrance and saturation. Most of the time, like I said, especially when you're starting out, that might be all you want to do and all you even need to do in an ideal world. So that you can cycle through, obviously, all your before, before and afters there, or we can just go back to our original by pushing the loop view button here or the letter D on the keyboard. So this is where we're currently at. All right, so we'll close our basic tab. Let me show you, sometimes you might have a horizon that's crooked. Um, generally with my processing, I approach whatever bugs me the most. So some images, maybe the horizon's off and you just wanna fix that straight away. It's not too bad on this one at all, but if you wanna adjust that, the crop tool up here, you select that. And then now we have the grid that comes up. Often I'll just highlight the numbers on the angle and use the up and down on the keyboard and you'll see it adjusts for us and straightens as we go as we move that angle up and down for our image i think i'm just going to leave that the other thing that you may want to do is actually crop in i obviously recommend you don't crop if you can avoid it because you're just cutting off the resolution of your image but let's face it sometimes you just want to you need to crop right so i will i like to leave the ratio as what i shot which is a two to three ratio so that means as i click and drag the crop and then click and move around, we can adjust it, but it's still a two to three ratio image. You can make your own custom ratios or some of the more popular ones. For example, let's say 16 by nine, and that's how you do it. You just select it there, drag to apply it. We just push the crop button, bang, it's locked it in. Today, I'm just gonna leave it as our two to three. So I go back to the crop tool and push it back to as shot. It's filled up the whole frame. I'm happy with that. Again, I just push the crop button and it gets us out of there. So that's just straightening and the cropping. Let me show you now local adjustments, which is some of the most powerful things you can do in your processing. And for me, the next tool I'll show you is my key tool for doing my post-processing on every single image. It's called the adjustment brush. In Lightroom, we have the masking button, the circle up here. So when I select that, we're going to get these options here. Add new mask. And it's saying, do you want to, a mask, think of it as a selection. So it's saying, do you want to select a subject, the sky, the background, or do we want to use these tools to make local adjustments? The brush, the linear gradient, blah, blah, blah. Guys, all you need to know about is the brush in my opinion, okay? So we're going to use the adjustment brush. Shortcut is K. So if I push K on the keyboard, we now have the adjustment brush, this is it here. Over on the right hand side, we have the opportunity on our brush to adjust the feather, which is basically the softness or hardness of the brush. The flow and density, meaning when we click, is it going to 100% apply what we've asked it to, or do we need to do multiple clicks and multiple passes over it? 
For me personally, I like to leave all of those at 100. So feel free to copy along with that if you like. Totally up to you. You can have a play and experiment with how you like the brush to be. To change the size, the two fastest ways are right clicking, slide the mouse left and right to change the size, or depending on your mouse, you may use the scroll wheel, sliding that up and down to make the adjustment. The other thing you can do on the keyboard is next to the letter P, the bracket buttons open and closing left and right will change the brush size. It's real handy to know those, pretty unrealistic to use the size slider up here. As you can see now, we have all the similar sliders that we had on our global adjustments, but now what it's going to do is apply it to the edge of the brush. And the way the brush works with our feather that we have so high, I'm just gonna throw this right down to something ridiculous on the exposure. The inner circle will get 100% of whatever the adjustment is, and then the brush, it'll fade out gradually to 0% by the time that gets to the outer circle. So you see that there, I've clicked once and you can see how the inner circle is getting that full adjustment of the exposure we made. And then it very, very gently bleeds out to the edges. I really like that because it means that I don't have to be very accurate with the brush. If for example, I'm brightening an area and the tip of the brush goes outside the line, very rarely you're gonna notice because it's just getting a small amount of whatever the adjustment was that I made. So for this image here, let's make some local adjustments to create some separation and depth in our background. The main way I like to do that is on the brush, I will either bring up the shadows and the blacks, and sometimes I'll also grab the dehaze slider and slide to the left, I rehaze. And you'll see what this does now as I click over here. See how that's lifting all of those exact things that I've asked it to. I'm doing everything in the background I'll even run off to these trees over here. Now, it's gone a little bit heavier than I wanted it to. The beautiful thing is now we can come over and tweak our adjustment. So what I might do is just dial back that rehaze a little bit and you can see in real time the adjustment that it's making like that. What I will do now is build up multiple local adjustments to work on the file, just like as if you're an artist using a brush dipping the brush in different paint and then applying it to the image. What I'd like to do now is darken the top part of the sky to lead the eye downwards back into the frame. So we're going to push K. That instantly gives us a new brush. You'll see on the layer box up here. Now, by the way, if your mask box is looking a lot bigger or different, you can click and drag and move these around. You can minimize them and everything like that. So mine, I just like to tuck it away up like that. So with this brush, like I said, let's darken the sky. We're going to bring down some of the exposure on this one. You need to guess, you don't really know what it's going to be. You just adjust the slider, apply it, and then tweak. We go a larger brush. I'll use the edge of the brush now, so it's not too heavy. And I'm running that along, angling it a little bit away from the tree. I don't want the tree to get too dark. Bring that down like so. And it's probably a little bit heavy, so now I'll pull up the exposure a touch. And if anything, I might just pull the highlights down on it. And now it's just working on the highlights up there. What I'm going for is an effect where I'm darker on all my edges and then brighter in the background. We've got that beautiful highlight on the cloud, so that's going to help draw the eye into the scene. But making those edges darker is also going to help do that as well. Let's do another brush. This time we might actually warm up all the light back there in the distance. So I push K, we've got a new one. This time we can bring up the temperature and maybe a little bit of the magenta. And I'm just going to run that through all along the horizon there, anywhere where that warm light was going, all the way across like so. And basically what I do is just keep looking and adjusting. So another one might be, let's do K again. We'll go a little bit smaller and we'll just pull up some of the dark tones on those plants in the midground. So I've just pulled up the shadows. We'll see if that does the job for us like so. And look how inaccurate I'm being with the brush. I'm not zooming in at a ridiculous level and trying to trace around the edges. That would take all day and not be fun at all. The goal is to make this fun and effective. And if you're enjoying it and it's not too hard, then you're gonna keep doing it and you're gonna get the results that you're after. So I've just gone through and worked on them. Again, if it, the brush goes outside that bush, it doesn't really matter because the adjustment was so small, the edge of the brush is making a very minimal impact. You're not going to notice it on the image too much. So that's our local adjustments using the adjustment brush. Now, the next thing I'd like to show you 
is the color grading. So we need to get out of the masking. And by the way, with the masks, you can hover back over them in your masking panel and they're showing you where they are. If you want, you can click readjust it if you don't like you know, what you've done with that. So for example, this one here, maybe I thought I went too heavy on the black, so I can bring that back down, etc. So it's really handy that you can go back through. There's even an erase option, so you can click the, the negative subtract there, and then you can say, I'd like to subtract with a brush, for example, and then you can actually go through and erase that application that you've done. I'm gonna do Control Z to undo that, so I don't want to erase it. But just keep that in mind, you can go through, tweak them, adjust them, and even erase them. So it's very handy. The other thing that I do with my brushes, I'm just gonna push K to show you this. Reset sliders automatically. I have that selected, and that just means every time we do push K or pick a new brush or a mask in general, these sliders get reset. And that's obviously makes more sense. So you're starting with a fresh brush every single time. Let's jump into the color grading now. Another very common tab I use in my post-processing. And that's right down here. If I want to get out of the masking tool, I can just push the mask button like that. And now we're out of it. So here we go down. We're skipping the tone curve, the HSL, straight to the grading. We open this guy up and we have these three wheels. And what this is allowing us to do now is introduce a certain hue, a color tone, into these areas of light, the shadows, the highlights, or the midtones. Very effective thing you can do in your images is warm your highlights and cool your shadows, and that creates a nice natural contrast that we find in the real world. It's happening right now. We're very blue in our shadow zones, and we're quite warm in those highlights. I just want to accentuate that. So what you do is, for our highlights, if we want to warm those, clicking the outer circle and moving that into our color of choice. So we want to move into these warmer tones. Now to apply the saturation or the grading, we need to click this inner circle and drag that outwards to start saturating. If I don't hold shift right now and just start sliding, you'll see it kind of starts moving all over the place. It's very frustrating. So <laughs> what you do is you hold shift and it creates that line. And that means we're on a fixed point now and we can't fall off that hue. And I'm going to drag that up like so. And I'm just going to leave it, you know, roughly somewhere around there. So have a play with that. Like I said, sometimes I'll cool the shadows then to create that nice natural contrast. So going into the blues, hold shift, click and drag. And we've just started cooling those just a little bit like so. So that's your color grading. You can do the midtones as well. This one, I'm just going to leave it, but have a play with your file. Typically, I find that I'm working on shadows and highlights. Another very common tool you will need to know how to use is the healing tool. And that is often used for removing things that you don't like in the scene. In particular, our good old friend, the dust spot. So when I click the mouse, it zooms automatically, the magnifying tool. You can slide around either on the trackpad or if you're on a laptop especially on the mac or i'm on the mouse here on the windows i just use the wheel to slide up and down here on the windows i already have the hand there the hand means i'm ready to move so it's just click and slide around just using the mouse wow there's a lot of dust spots in this one my apologies but good for the lesson so what we do to remove these guys is we select the spot the healing tool we have three options here in the mode content aware remove the heal tool and then the clone often for the dust spots i'll use the heal have a play with all three but the heal i'll leave the feather and opacity high with the size again you can just do what we did before with the brush open and close brackets right click and slide or on the mouse wheel slide up and down so you go over your dust spot make it slightly larger than the area you want to work on you can click and hold and slide around or just click once. Now it grabs an area of similar color and tonality. And we want to lock that in. So if we're happy with that, we can just push the enter button and now it has applied it. So what you do in this scenario is just click across the various dust spots and generally it should do a good enough job. So for the tutorial, I'm not going to bother trying to move every single one. Again, I apologize that there's so many in here. Um, this is why we need to blow out our sensors. You can just use a dust blower 
or you can buy the uh, cleaning swabs and just clean it yourself. You can take it to a store, but honestly, I've never bothered doing that. Um, <laughs> and maybe that's obvious here, you can see why, but no, generally the dust blower will do the right job. So if I push enter now, if I select the tool again to get out of there, you can see that yet yeah, definitely we've made some progress. There is certainly a few more that could be removed, but I'm just gonna save time today and not do it with you, but definitely go through and have a play with doing that yourself. Analyzing the image now, you know, it's getting close to done. One of the other things that I'll show you is utilizing again on the adjustment brush. If we push K, we get the brush come up and put some white on the brush. What I like to say is white is light. So I use the whites to boost anywhere that just has a little bit of light on it already. So all that grass through the mid ground, these trees, you can see as I'm running along, it gives a very nice gentle lift. Um, looks quite realistic and not too over the top. And I'm just doing that all through the area where I wanna make sure the eye is able to enjoy those details all the way through here. One last thing with the brush, I push K, create a bit of soft glowing light back there. We'll go for a larger brush size. We're going to rehaze and just apply that type of glow back there like that. Sometimes I'll warm that up slightly. In this case, I'm just going to dial it back a little bit too, but you can see that result like so. With the masks here, if I expand the box so we can have a look, you can turn them on and off. So before and after basically on each one, you're able to see now the result from all our local adjustments, what we've made across the image. And it just shows you how powerful they are having all of those masks there. If we turn off all the local adjustments, that's how the image looks. Let's reapply our masking. Bang. So you can see how we've used that to help reveal those details and lead the eye through the scene, creating a sense of depth in the image. Going to move on to the next raw file. We might use a few other tools, but for me, this is the main adjustments I'm doing across most of my images and utilizing that adjustment brush is where I do most of my post-processing. Now what you're gonna find, particularly on a place like YouTube, there's a million different ways to get results like this. There's a million different teachers out there and everyone, all of us have our own personal preferences. As I said earlier, my goal is to enjoy the whole process, to make it simple and have fun. And this workflow that I've developed and just working with brushes for me feels highly um, organic and I just enjoy doing it. And I'm able to get the results that I'm after. So we're gonna move on to the next one now, the Seascape. I won't be breaking down the tabs in detail like I did before, but follow along and then we might jump into one or two of the other ones just to show you what those are like. And then I wanna show you how you can save the files so they're not just sitting there as a raw. Okay, let's do it. What we're going to do is go down to our thumbnails, select the seascape image. Let's work on this bad boy. Another huge dynamic range here, worse than the last one. Dynamic range is that tonal range that we have from the shadows to the highlights. And in this case, it's quite extreme. We've got very dark darks and very bright brights. Look at the histogram. That's showing us that we've got lots of dark tones and then the highlights, so a huge contrast basically. But with our modern sensors, that's not too much of a problem. Back in the day, you'd need a series of exposures to show these details and now we can do it with a single exposure. So let's have a look. Just like before, we're gonna bring up everything now evenly so it looks realistic. Then we'll recover that sky with our highlights tab. I'm gonna leave that about there. Again, I don't wanna turn it to cheese and go too far down, it won't look normal. So we're gonna leave that relatively bright still. And now the shadows, we start to reveal them, but again, not too much, otherwise we're in some kind of funky, ultra high dynamic range town, which doesn't look normal. So we'll get out of funky town and we'll leave that roughly about there, somewhere around that point. And I'm gonna, in increase the shadows and dark tones back here to create that sense of depth because that's how the real world works. Anything further away will have less of a tonal range like that, less contrast, less value in those blacks. Look at that horizon back there. Mm. We're gonna fix that. So straight down to the lens correction tab. The chromatic aberration, do we have any to maybe show you what it looks like? Yeah, not really. Um, 
but anyway, we'll get out of there, so that's fine. We're gonna remove it anyway, and now the enable profile correction, you can see that's slightly helping things. So now we're going to jump into the crop tool, going to click those numbers and push down, and I'm just straightening up to line up with that grid. Bang, all right, I'm happy with that result. I'm gonna go back into my basic tab for the global adjustments. Close that lens correction one, straight to the vibrance. I'm gonna throw in about 25-ish or so, 26 there, and saturation, not as much. Now, the temperature, warm that up globally a little bit. Magenta, there's a little bit of magenta down in that water there. Dial that back slightly, like that. And what I'm going to do is, you guessed it, K, okay, adjustment brush. Let's start to make local adjustments. The first thing I'll do is lead the eye down by darkening the upper part of the sky. And then as things travel off into the distance, it shouldn't be as dark for the reasons I mentioned before. We've got the same thing in the foreground. It's okay to have darker edging here, but back here we really wanna separate those tones and break it up. So I push K for a new brush and now I'll just bring up the shadows and blacks and rehaze slightly. And we're going to apply and then assess the result and then tweak accordingly. Don't mind that result already. Uh, maybe a little, you know what? I'm just gonna leave that one. I'm gonna push K. We'll do a new one here. Warm this one up and rehaze and just really accentuate that glowing light light back there and draw the eye in. I'll dull the magenta down a touch, probably don't need that too high. And I'll just show you the before and after on that one so you get an idea of what I've just applied. So off, on. So just creating that sense of distance even further through that center part of the scene. I'm going to push K now for a new brush. Minimize that out of the way. And on this brush, I'm going to bring up the whites and highlights. I want to bring those back, you know. When we did that highlight recovery before, I was looking at the sky, but what you need to be aware of is that that's removing highlights globally when we did that. And highlights look beautiful, particularly on subject matter like this. Rock, water, etc. I don't want it to be too demanding and distracting, but it's just creating a nice tonal depth in all these dark tones by lifting those out. Won't go on the water that much because it's already bright enough for my liking. Going to push K again. This time I might actually do some texture. Texture I find is quite subtle and looks very nice. The clarity for me is a little bit nasty so I very rarely use the clarity slider, but it will run through. All this is close so I wanna really create that visual impact and have that as a higher texture area. And then as the image fades off in the distance, we'll lose that texture. So I'll slide that up a little bit more. I'm going overboard on purpose here just to show the effect. And if I turn that on and off, hopefully you can somewhat see the result. So without, and then with, bang. Minimize that one now. Let's jump into our color grading. We'll get out of the masking, the local adjustments. We'll minimize that. Grading, I'm gonna warm those highlights. We've already got it happening. Look how warm that sky is. Looks beautiful, but I'll just very slightly enhance that a little bit more. Somewhere around there. Then in those shadows, just a little bit cooler. No, that's nasty, I don't like that. That was a bit too much. And you know what? I think I'm going to leave that. I just want to have a look at the mids. What do we have in the mid-tones? Sometimes the mids, you're warm, you're cool, or you just won't touch at all. You know, it is a little bit tempting to warm those up because it's lifting all of those rock tones. What happens if we cool them down? Yeah, I'm not really liking that. I actually don't mind it being a touch warmer. Just really boosting that light that the sun is throwing across all the subject matter here. I'm going to push K. Sometimes in water, you might actually very slightly cool that down. I don't know if in this image we need to do that. Just a little bit there. Not on top of the water, not back here. So it's a lot warmer back there with the sun, but just here in more of the shadow zone. Cool that down slightly. So we'll get out of our local adjustments now. And the last thing I'll show you is 
in the detail tab sharpening sometimes you may want to sharpen the image i very rarely do to be honest um, but if you did want to sharpen one thing to keep in mind is sharpening might look great on rocks for example but not in nice soft water or up in you know beautiful cloud that you have at sunrise this image is a little bit soft in general it's not as tack sharp um, as say some others the main reason for that is the f-stop that I've used when I've shot this. I've closed the f-stop down quite a lot in order to get this slower shutter speed. When you do that, the lens optically won't be as good. This is something for me that when I first started out sharpening, it was I was obsessed with it. And then as time went on, I realized, you know, even if you printed this huge, you're not standing here staring at it up close. I definitely want everything in focus and actually sharp, but the level of sharpness is just something that I feel is overrated, to be honest. Um, anyway, if we're going to sharpen this one, like I said, we can click the detail tab, slide the sharpening slider. I'll zoom in so you can kind of watch that in real time. So I've dialed that right back to do nothing. Dial it up to the right so you can see this working. When you increase the sharpening by a lot, it starts to add little artifacts in there and it can look nasty pretty quick. So I'd never go up as high as I have, but let's say we go to something at about 80. What we can do now is mask that off certain areas and typically what you'd want to do is have the sharpening on your dark tones and edges but not in something like the sky for example so you can use that masking slider and slide that up and down if you hold the alt key on the keyboard anything that is white is getting the sharpening black is not and gray is partially so i would maybe slide that around to a point like this so now the sharpening is in most places i want it to be in those dark tones but not up in the soft areas in the sky etc so just keep that in mind it's a good way that you can basically mask the sharpening off and just have it applying exactly where you want it to apply like so if we do the before and after on this one down the bottom here we have our option to do that so we push right here and cycle through those different views. You can see we've got a pretty big result there. And again, quite simple, quite fast to get that. And that's shooting directly towards the sunrise with backlit rocks. The challenge is how much detail do you reveal? If you reveal too much, it might not look right. If you haven't revealed enough, then we're gonna to struggle to see it. That's the challenge and that's where practice comes into play. The last thing I'll show you on this image here now is how do we export this to be something that you can share online um, and get it out of Lightroom because everything we have done here in Lightroom, when we go back to the other image as well, these are still the original raw files. You can't actually change the raw. All these settings in Lightroom, everything we've done is essentially like an illusion. It's like just putting sunglasses over. Every time we go back to those files, Lightroom checks in its catalog and it looks at, it has a memory now of all these adjustments. But the raw is always a raw. You should be able to navigate that in your computer to the downloads folder, for example, wherever you've stored it. And the raw is there. This will not be on the raw. This is just within Lightroom. It's like a memory, right? So how do we create a new file that does have this locked in? So it's locked in and you can email it off, you can share it online. Well, now we need to export it. So let's look at exporting. If we go back to our library on the top left, sorry, top right on the left of develop, here's our files here. You can see it's got the edits applied now. And what we're going to do is down the bottom left hand corner export. We select that. There's kind of two things I like to do now. Firstly, I would want to potentially add it to the portfolio. Now, for me personally, I wouldn't get to that point until I've let this sit here and I've looked at it multiple times across a week or a month or whatever. For me, it takes several passes over to get the final result. What we've done today is probably 90% complete, but some of the finer details and tweaks and cleaning up you want to really you know let the image marinate sit there and soak it up and check it several times once you've done that and you are happy with it you may now want to save it to be a high res uncompressed file that you're able to access in years to come and it's got the whole edit applied for today we just chuck it on the desktop for example and what i would do with this file is if you're just a lightroom user if you don't use photoshop whatsoever 
then you can just save this as a TIFF file. So under file settings, we just wanna go down to TIFF, all right? Generally, I'll leave the bit depth at 16. And with the color space, I often just leave it on either Adobe RGB or sometimes the P3, which is just another color profile that's common on the Macs um, and most operating systems. I don't see too much difference between the two personally, so don't stress out about that either way. So we've selected TIFF, which is a high res uncompressed file, and then I won't resize it at all. I don't want to shrink it down or enlarge it in any way. I just want it untouched basically at the default size. Output sharpening, I typically don't worry too much about that. Again, you probably won't see much difference either way. Name, definitely throw in a name there, something descriptive. I would put this on my portable hard drive, not the desktop, and it would go into either a drafts folder or my portfolio folder. Again, call it something, something descriptive. We've selected TIFF, that's it. Then you push export, boom. Now you've got that as a separate high res file. If you now want to get that on the internet to share with people, what you'll do is not have it as a TIFF, but instead as a JPEG. This time we do want to resize it. So we'll leave the quality high, and this time we resize to fit. What I personally do is on the longest edge, 1500 pixels. So resize your image down to 1500, whatever the longest edge is, that's why you just select this. And now it's going to bring that down to a size that will still look good online, but isn't high enough that people can save and print and use it um, without your permission. That looks good on social media, websites, everything like that. So JPEG, resize to fit. With the color space again, personal preference, but you can have a play at your different outputs. For me, it's either P3 or the Adobe RGB. But honestly, there's not too much difference between those. All right, everyone, I hope you enjoyed that tutorial. As always, if you have any questions whatsoever, just leave them in the comments below and I'll get back to you. And like I always say, the best way to learn is just to get out there yourself and keep practicing and it will all come together. So just make sure you're having fun. Anyway, thanks for the support. Hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.